Welcome to Worth Your for Woodworking and this new series that I'm kind of calling my prerequisite course because in my years of teaching I've always found that brand new woodworkers or even those I've been in it for a while if they haven't gotten a basic foundation of just kind of terminology theories and stuff like that it kind of hinders their learning curve and they get a little bit frustrated and the worst thing you can have in a new woodworker is a frustrated woodworker because they then become a non-woodworker. So this course is just going to cover some of the basics so that when you go into a class or you watch YouTube videos or read a book or something like that, a lot of it will make a lot more sense to you. And in this first class, I'm basically going to explain how all woodworking machines uh, and tools work. But before we do that one, you know, in the beginning of every semester, you know, you always have to introduce yourself to the teacher and that kind of stuff. So, I'll start. My name is Sean Graham. I've been teaching woodworking for about a decade now. And before that, I spent the better part of a decade teaching um, high school technology classes, computer classes. And before that, I was on the 14-year college program where it takes 14 years of night school to get a BA in whatever you're doing. And I kind of paid my way working at motorcycle dealerships and stuff like that. So, now that you know me, how about you? Oh, you catching a problem here? Yeah, I cannot be a teacher in this kind of subject matter because this is not a two-way communication path. The best I can do is be an educational resource. Nothing more than, more than a glorified animated textbook. I can present the information, but I really can't check for understanding or modify how I'm presenting it to you for the best interpretation. That can only be done with a teacher one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, a good quality teacher really doesn't talk that much because they're feeding off of you to give you just the right information to draw the correct answer, to draw the knowledge out of you. I, on the other side of the screen, really am just an animated textbook. Because of this, I'm going to hope that a lot of y'all will actually use this series more as a teacher's guide or a teacher's aid to help you to teach your own teenager or fellow friends or something like the craft. Let it give you little hints and techniques to present the knowledge in a more general way though, so maybe they can interpret it a little bit better or you can feed off of them to figure out how to give them that information. And because of that, in the description of this entire prerequisite course series, you'll find a link to a separate video that I'm going to be calling my teacher's aid. And it'll talk about a lot of the prep you'll need to do and maybe some different angles and stuff you can approach. But as I said, this particular video is to help explain all of woodworking tools to you. So let's get going. To start out, all of woodworking is basically the interaction between an edge and wood fibers. Every single tool, with maybe the exception of laser cutters, which are more science fiction than woodworking, involve edges and fibers. So to start a quick little exercise that will help explain this, first thing we need to do is examine the board we're going to be working with. This is just a little three inch by about seven inch pine board. You can buy them by at any one of the big box stores. They come like one by fours and then a certain length right there. But to work it, you have to be able to look at that board and understand how it grew in the tree. Now this pine board right here is fairly straight grain. You can tell that one because if you just look at the board, the grain's kind of running straight, somewhat boring. And you can see the late growth and early growth where in the color variations where it grows fairly fast in spring and summer and stuff like that. And then it kind of pairs back during winter. It doesn't grow as much, so you get darker growth rings. And we call them rings because they kind of curve around and form a big circle. This is just a small section of a circle. And the curve right here on this board right there is kind of coming up like that right there. Which means the, or kind of like that right there, which means the center of the tree was way over there somewhere. This came from a fairly large tree. But that could tell you that the, the tree grew standing up like that. And that's important because a tree, dependent upon its orientation and how you're working on it, can either be very strong, very weak, very hard, or very, very soft. Let me explain. 
Now, trees themselves have to hold a lot of weight. I mean, if you've ever picked up a log or something like that, you know they're heavy. And if you just look at a tree, imagine all those logs you picked up combined. If there's a lot of weight bearing down on the tree. So they have to be very, very strong and rigid in the upright position in order to just deal with the weight of it. And you can prove that one by taking a hammer and if you bang on the board, it doesn't really dent much. That is still dead smooth. It didn't compress it very much at all. But that same tree also has to be flexible. I mean, if it didn't flex at all, when the wind blew, these things would be snapping left and right. So we have a material that's both hard and rigid, but flexible. But it also has to be soft because the way they get that flexibility between hard parts of the tree is with those growth rings. You see the growth rings that are running up and down the tree are fairly hard, but they have a material that's binding in between them that can be very soft. And when you do that one, you have multiple hard things, but they can slide next to each other a little bit with a flexible material. That's how you can allow it to curve some as the tree moves around in the wind. And you can tell that by if I take that same board I had where I banged on the top and it really didn't do much to it, if I come over to the side and just give it a good whack, look at how much it actually dents. It actually compresses quite a bit. So it's really strong going down, but fairly soft going sideways. And that sideways can be going both this direction and that direction. Now, every woodworking tool we use, be it plane, chisel, bandsaw, table saw, chainsaw, hacksaw, whatever, all those tools take advantages of those features of the wood. Their strengths, their weaknesses, their rigidness and their flexibility. Let's do a quick exercise to give you an idea of all those different attributes. I want you to find some way of securing the piece of wood that we've been working with. It could be a clamp or just something to hold it down, one of those quick, clamp, quick clamps on the side. I'm going to use what's called a bench hook. And basically it's just a board with another board on bottom. I typically use a a ruler on the back side, a wooden ruler, and another one on top. And these are both kind of at 90 degrees so that I can hook it onto the edge of the board, push it up, and I can press against it and it's not going anywhere. The clamping action comes from my body weight. So I put a piece of work right here, I can hold it steady. And then I want you to give a, give a nice sharp chisel. I'm going to be using a half inch. Now, concerning chisel use, a chisel is a two-handed tool. Either both hands are on this tool itself, or one hand is on this tool, and another hand is on another tool, like a mallet, propelling it. Basically, the front hand provides direction. The back hand, or tool, provides propulsion. You never use a chisel one-handed. That's when things can get dangerous. Having said that, this exercise we are about to do we are going to use it one-handed, but I think when you see us doing it, you'll understand it's a safe operation. It's just kind of weird that the very first thing I'm having you or somebody else do if you want to do this ex exercise is to break the rules, but it's where we're at. Now, what I want you to do is actually hold the, the chisel like a pencil, okay? Except instead of having the back leaning towards your body, I want you to lean it forward so that the far tip, the far tip is angled down. Then I want you to try and draw some straight lines going across the grain and feel what's happening. Can you hear the difference how it's going click, 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 click as it glows across? Maybe flip it around so that the bevel is going the other way. Try to draw one line right next to the other and see what happens. Just make several passes. Try and draw a line in the same line. We're just experimenting here. Notice how easy it is to draw a straight line in this situation. Noticing some shavings coming off. Notice how much the top of the chisel is dancing around. 
Do you feel like the tip is going deeper and then popping up, deeper and popping up? You can actually feel the harder and softer woods as the chisel wants to dive into the soft woods, but it kind of skips over the hard woods. It rides up on them. Now I want you to do the same exact thing, except this time push the board so you're going to go along with the grain. Feel the difference. Oh, it's much smoother, but how easy is it to draw a straight line? Can you go over those grains or does it kind of want to follow the softer part of the wood? I mean, do you really have control? I notice even after just three lines, it's kind of wanting to go in the existing path by itself. But it doesn't want to go any deeper. It just kind of falls along that line. In effect, it's not really getting too much work done, but the cut is so much smoother. Just listen to it. But is any wood now popping out? I mean, over here, I had shavings popping out. Now I want you to push it forward, or break it, brace it, and then lay, instead of working off of the tip, one of the corners, lay it down flat with the bevel pointing up. Come back about a, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch, and then push. I want you to see how much work you can get done if every time you come back, you come back a little farther, and you push a little deeper. I mean, look at all the wood we are removing really quickly, really easily. I'm just pressing down with my hand. But I also notice it's coming, it's creating a nice shoulder on the sides too. I mean, you can peel those shavings off. They're like little Frito chips. But look at the sides. They're fairly straight. And we got quite a bit of work done there with just our hand pressure. Now let's do the same exact thing, except this time go to the side of the board. Pressing in. Oh, what's that? A little twist and it pops off. It's a super clean cut, right? I mean, that's almost joinery ready. It's just getting work done that's so pretty. I mean, yeah. Big comparison between this and that. Now I want you to take that same board, kind of put it on its side, place your chisel maybe a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch back from the edge, ride it up, and grab that mallet. And we're going to start whacking on it. Notice how much work you're getting done. Just light taps and wood's just popping off left and right. You're probably throwing shrapnels at the person next to you. Fairly quick and easy way to remove a lot of wood. Come back a little bit more. Go down again. It's just flying out of there in these little chips. But what would happen if we came back more towards the middle of the board and did the same exact thing? Give it a good strike. Again, 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 again. Hit it harder and harder. Well, it's just not going much deeper, is it? I could hit it as hard as I want and just not going to be doing that much more work. But notice we had shavings popping out over here. Nothing came out here. Let's try that again. Come back a little ways. Give it a few good heavy whacks. No wood came out. It's still there. Now let's try the same exact thing, just going parallel with the wood. Line it up, give it a few whacks. And can you notice, see that crack coming through it? What would happen if we just give it one more heavy whack? The board just split. What you just experienced was every way a blade can interact with the wood in the extreme levels. We basically went straight across grain with a slicing action as if we were taking a knife and trying to cut it in half. We then went with the grain in that same slicing tool. And did you notice that not a lot of wood was coming out? We kind of just kind of sliced it and then compressed it. It didn't really move anywhere. Whereas when we were going across a grain, 
if you slice one side of it and then moved over about you know a sixteenth of an inch slice the other side the wood in the middle just kind of falls out then we went to the edge and we went straight across the grain again because we're going across the grain with straight edge it's a slicing of the fibers action but by going down the force of the bevel shoved the wood out it kind of broke it along the sides see on the face where we we're coming down it's a nice and s smooth cut but the edges are somewhat b jagged because they just broke off and that breaking action is what we call a split but whenever we move back towards the center because it wasn't close to the edge so that the force of just the bevel could break it off i mean we had a lot of wood between here and there it just compressed those fibers because in between the grains the late growth versus the early growth is kind of soft as we discussed earlier so those fibers just compressed but the moment i turned the chisel to the side all of a sudden it stopped becoming a cutting edge and became a wedge where this bevel was spreading the wood apart and you could tell at every strike that split that was happening see it broke up here taking advantage of the weakness of the wood it had nothing really to do with the cutting edge it was the splitting action that we were taking advantage of to get the work done and that was the same thing that was happening when we we're taking the edge and going across a grain it wasn't cutting the wood it was splitting it see how far over to the edge it split off whereas in this direction we slice the fibers first and then they broke off you have just experienced three of the four cuts that you have in woodworking and it doesn't really matter which branch of the craft you go into they all have variations of these four cuts. That's the slicing cut, the planing cut, uh, the, the splitting, and scraping. We haven't covered scraping, which we will get to that later down the road. But most of the time, we are either slicing, planing, or splitting wood. Now, every branch might call it a different cut, like in the turning world. Splitting is generally uh, referred to as peeling. And if you're into wood carving, you know, a lot of times the different functions that you're doing with the wood, planing, comes down to your grips that you're using. I'm going with the grain. The blade is parallel, perpendicular to the grain. And I'm getting those shadings like we did when we went across it. But a lot of times you're coming, uh, going straight across the grain with different cuts. And that's slicing those fibers so that you can have a weak spot for you to come down into i mean it's all the same even with other hand tools or power tools let's quick take a quick look at some popular hand tools so i have two saws here these two saws are identical same steel same back same handle same weight same size same shape with the exception of how the teeth on the saw were actually filed out now there are a couple differences between the teeth this one right here has fewer teeth per inch there are more teeth on this one that's irrelevant for what we are doing right now let me try to put a magnifying glass on top of this to magnify it up a little bit i want you to know the the saw blade on this side see if you can look at the individual teeth notice that every other tooth has something like a bevel to it let me see if i can angle it a little bit so you can see the light reflecting see how the, it gets dark every other one because there's a bevel there this one right here they all look just like shark tooth little zigzags now let's look at the teeth kind of at a sideways angle let me see if i can get it in focus okay this one right here is the one that actually has more teeth per inch this one has fewer teeth per inch but on this one notice you're seeing every single tooth and the reflection kind of goes across sideways where this one you're actually only seeing the reflection off of every other tooth let me see if i can see how it kind of flips because these are coming up to the point where some teeth the bevel is coming in from this direction sometimes the bevel is coming in this direction it kind of alternates sides 
forgive my horrid drawing, but in essence, what you have is a saw with a bunch of chisels that are sitting like this, one alternating other, going straight across a blade. And then this one has one chisel where the tip, see, notice I'm angling it. The tip is here. Then this one, the tip is there. This one, the tip is here. This one, the tip is there. This one, the tip is here, there, here, there. So in essence, one of these is a bunch of chisels that are kind of this slicing action where it's going to make a slice of the fibers on one side, then flip over and just slightly next to it, see if I can do this freehand, it's going to make another slice. And when you get close enough and deep enough with those slices, what happens to the fibers in the middle? They just kind of pop out. Okay. The other one is taking the chisel and making slices like this. It cross cuts the fibers and then planes the shaving out. So in essence, I have two saws, one of them configured in a cross cutting to go across the grain and the other figured in a rip cut to plane down the board to slice it out in order to get the work done quickly. Because if you remember, when we put the chisels point on with the grain, yes, that first cut, it kind of indented it, but no wood was coming out, and we were just kind of pressing it down. And each subsequent cut, we didn't get much work done. But when we turned it sideways, it was easy to get a lot of work done. But when we did that sideways action here, it just kind of destroyed the board, ripping it apart. Whereas we got nice clean cuts going on the corner of the chisel. So, let's see if that works like that in the real world. So I've got my two saws. I do not know which is which at this moment. I'm just going to pick one of them and then just holding it ever very gently so that only the weight of the back of these saws is actually putting any downward force. I'm going to see how many strokes it takes to bottom the saw out. So here we go. Very light cut. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and I am bottomed out. Okay, place this saw down, pick up the next saw, do the same exact thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 24 cuts. So just judging by the fact that it took almost twice as far to go, go down, and this is what they call a ripping cut, uh, basically planing, I'm going to assume this one was a cross cut. Yep, 12 TPI cross cut. I also noticed that this one was a little bit harder for me to control going straight because it kind of wanted to track with the grain. When it went across one of the grains, it kind of bound up on me and it wanted to go with the grain. This one didn't care as it cut across some of these grain patterns. So this one was definitely the rip one. Designed to go with the grain along taking a planing cut. Now let's try the same thing. So I might not be able to bottom it out because my this board isn't that big, but we'll go for it. And just listen to what's happening because we now know that this is the rip, this is the cross cut. So here's the cross cutting saw. Here it's kind of like ripping. Now let's listen to this one. Much harder to start. Now, break that off. Let's go look at the other side. Can you tell which one was designed for cross cutting? Much cleaner cut, right? This one just destroyed it. It split it out. It broke it off. Now, how about a hand plane? So I've got here just a regular old block plane. It's actually set to take a pretty heavy cut. I'm going with the grain. And we will talk a lot more about that term going with the grain later on in another segment. 
But if I paint it like this right here, you notice once I get past saw marks, I'm getting those shape, long curly shavings like I did when I took the chisel and did it like this, because the blade is in fact going straight across. And you can get really smooth, easy cuts that way. But if I take that same board and move it sideways, did you hear the difference? It's not necessarily cutting, it's splitting. And you get a lot, see it's splitting stuff out. And it's not nearly as smooth a finish. You, can you see the light reflecting differently on either side? This is very rough, this is glass smooth. Now, by its nature, splitting gets work done faster. Get, you can more, remove more material quicker. And traversing, going across the grain with a hand plane, is one way people take advantage of the weakness of the wood by splitting off large chunks of it so that they can actually flatten boards quicker. You put a slightly curved blade going across the grain, you can remove gobs of wood fast. It doesn't have to be a slow process. But that's how hand tools are utilizing how that blade goes across it. What about some power tool examples? Here's my miter saw. With the intended purpose of what this saw is designed to do, which is where we lay boards this way and cross cut them, you're never going to put a, saw, a board in this way to, to cut on this kind of saw. It's always going across the grain. It's a cross cut. What do you think the blade that's supposed to be on this saw looks like? Yep. Every other tooth is angled differently. Granted, this, this blade is incredibly dirty, but you can see the point comes in here. So it's actually slicing the fiber and then scooping out what's in the middle. Slicing either side, scooping out what's in the middle. What about something like a table saw where, you know, we use a miter gauge to cross cut and we also use a rip fence, ripping, to rip. So we are go both going across the grain and with the grain in different operations on a table saw. Now let's look at some examples of table saw blades I have. This right here is a grooving blade. It's a quarter inch curve and it works kind of like a quarter inch dado. And this typically goes in a ripping fashion. So if you look at all the teeth, they're pretty much straight across all the way around. Just as if I was taking that chisel and going perpendicular to the grain. Then I have a general purpose combination blade that came with my saw stop. It is a combination blade. It's designed to be put in my saw and I can do both cross cut and rips okay. They don't do either one well because it's not designed for just one of those cuts. If you will notice, pretty much all the teeth, there's a point on them. This one, it's on the bottom. That one, it's on the top. Bottom, top. Bottom, well, that one doesn't have it. That one's straight across, as is this one. It's as if every fourth or fifth tooth is a chisel, a straight across blade. So the majority of the teeth are handling cross cuts and the minority is a handling a rip. So it's a combination blade. It does both. And that's pretty common because it, the, while a cross cut doesn't do much work, it does do a little bit and it'll get a cleaner cut. And then that uh, ripping one will just scoop out the middle. But if you're doing a lot of ripping, if you put a dedicated ripping blade on your table saw, it will fly. You can really feel a difference. Now what if instead of a round hole, you're needing to cut round wood, like on a lathe? Well, here's one of the more common tools. It's a skew chisel blade, blade right here. What's cool about it is if you have a piece of wood that's turning, I can use that tip to cross cut the wood, or I can lay it on its side to peel the wood, splitting it, or I can come at it at an angle and plane the wood. Even though the wood's moving instead of the tool this time, it's still the same basic cut. And if you get even fancier tools that have like a gullet in there, well, a lot of these will actually slice on the tip and plane on the edge to give you a nice smooth finish to do curves and stuff like that. 
Now, if you think about it, a bandsaw is kind of like a table saw in that it will do both cross cut and ripping. I mean, if you're turn cutting a curve, you're starting out ripping and then going into cross cutting or vice versa. So, depending upon your use, you will buy different blades for this one. I generally buy a general purpose blade that will go cross and rip. But if you're having something like a bandsaw mill where all you're doing is making boards, they could care less about its cross-cutting ability. They are just going to use a ripping blade and it will blast through those. I will tell you, if you've ever used a bandsaw, a lot of times when you're cutting curves, you'll say, ooh, it's cutting slow. Oh, it's speeding up, it's more efficient. Oh, now it's cutting slow. Because when you have a combination blade like this, kind of like on the table saw, it kind of puts a priority on the cross-cutting action because that is generally a little bit cleaner even in a ripping cut. But the ripping cut is really efficient ripping, but in the cross cutting it gives you a ragged look. So they kind of prioritize the cross cutting angle of this one. So what will happen is you'll have like two cross cuts, one rip. Two cross cuts, one rip. Or three, one, three, one, like that. Just take a close look at your bandsaw blade and you'll actually be able to see the difference on the angle of the teeth depending upon the function of the blade you put on there. So I hope you enjoyed that inter this introductory episode of our prerequisite course. Kind of a generalized course. Yes, we can dive a lot more deeply into each individual subject, but this just gives you a general idea. So now, no matter what you tool you go to, you can ask yourself, is this tool performing a cross cut, a rip, or a combination or both? Or how is it weighted? And then look at the blade to see how it's going to interact with it. Making sure you have the right blade on the right tool. I will tell you one of the most common errors I see is on miter saw, chop saws because they have a 10 inch blade. So a lot of times people just go to the home big box store and buy a combination blade and then they question why you're getting rougher cuts. It's, burning the wood, it's not doing as well, or splitting it out, that kind of stuff. It's because you don't need a combination blade if all it is doing is cross-cutting. That's why those machines have very specific blades. Now in my style of woodworking, the chisel is somewhat the foundation tool. In other branches of the craft, like turning, the skew is the foundation tool. In carving, the knife is the foundation tool. Uh, if you're into timber framing, it would be the axe. But all of those have one thing in common. They are a single straight edge. And you can utilize that straight edge in multiple different ways. I mean, I always say, if you get in trouble, the easiest way out is to pick up a chisel and get to work. So I would highly encourage you to pick up a chisel, find a small piece of wood, and try this experiment. It has value to actually feel the sensation and understand what's going on with the cutting edge and the grain of the wood. In the next episode, we'll talk about qualities of tools utilizing a chisel as an example. And if you're wanting to teach this lesson to somebody else, check down the description for uh, teacher's notes and uh, some vocabulary terms and stuff like that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. And remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.